Good afternoon, and we welcome you into uh, Thursday Night Bible Study here at Chicago Glory Worship Center. Uh, my name is Pastor William Lynch, and um, we are, in this segment of our study, we are concluding a series that we have been teaching on Christian discipleship, or church discipleship, uh, focus of living a life that counts. We have talked about spending time, we've talked about how valuable our time is and how we use our time. Uh, in our service and in our worship and, and how we use our time to better uh, our relationship with God and service to God. We also talked in terms of uh, uh, financial resources, uh, tithes and offerings, and, and how we allow God to use our resources to be a benefit to Him as well as to others. We also, last week, we talked in terms of uh, our talents and our gifts and how we use them and how God has gifted us to be a blessing to others as we minister to him, as we serve him, and as we serve others. On this installment, we shall be talking about and focusing our energies on giving it all to Jesus, giving everything to him. Um, let us talk with prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, my God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, we bless you, we praise you, we magnify you, we glorify your name, for you are truly worthy of all the praise and all the honor. We ask, oh God, that you be in the midst of us on this day, as we study, as we sit at your feet, as we uh, uh, seek to hear from thee, oh God, speak to our hearts and to our minds, guide and direct us as we go forward in this study on tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This story was, uh, was told by uh, Brian Wilkinson. He shared this story in a sermon he preached called sad man walking um, and this is what he this is what he writes I was out for a walk a week ago and it was one of those first warm days after the big snow as I made my way through one of the neighborhoods I came upon an older man out for a walk he was walking toward me very slowly as I got closer I noticed that one leg did not work too well and he was leaning heavily on a cane in his hands. Every few steps he had to pause, catch his breath. As I passed him, I noticed the emblem of a Navy ship on his cap and surmised that he was a veteran. On my way back a little later, I passed him again. This time, as he was shuffling into his driveway, he paused for a moment at the edge of the street and began poking at the snow bank with his cane. When I got close, I could see that he was trying to free some low-flying branches that had been buried by the passing plow. He was not very steady without his cane to lean on, and it took him a considerable effort uh, to, to, to beat back the heavy, wet snow. I could tell it was going to take him a while, but he was persistent, he was diligent in the task that he had before him. What struck me about the whole thing was that it was not enough for this man to take a walk on a balmy February day. He had to do something, solve a problem. He had to make the world, even the little world in his driveway, a little bit different, uh, a better place. He was not just out for a walk that afternoon. He was on a mission. He wanted to walk in the door of his house feeling satisfied that he had accomplished something. As he would sit in his favorite chair, reviewing the activities of the day, wiping the sweat from his brow, he would have the satisfaction in his heart that he had accomplished something on this day. Isn't that how it is for all of us as we make our way through this world? We want to do more than just get some fresh air and enjoy the scenery. We want to do something. We want to make a difference. We want someone or something to be better off because we pass this way. When we come to the end of our days, we want to have something to show for them. We want our lives to count. Christians want to make an impact that counts for all eternity. However, all of us have time, money, and talents all of us have something that could potentially cause us 
to walk away from Jesus and become the pride of a life that counts. The purpose of this study is to warn about the danger of holding back our resources from Jesus. Jesus offers us a life that counts now and forever. And all we have to do is get, let go of what we want and put our resources into his hands and allow him to direct our path and our course. Our scripture text on tonight that we will be focusing is, is, uh, is Mark 10 verses 17 through 31. And let me read that as we go forward in our study this evening. Mark 10, verses 17 to 31. And it reads as follows. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit? eternal life. And Jesus said unto him, Why calleth thy me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thy knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto them, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thy lack is, go thy way, sell whatever thy have, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and said unto his disciples, How hard are we? shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying amongst themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land for my sake, and the gospel. But he shall receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and land, which persecution, and in the world to come, eternal life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. What we have here is uh, traditionally what is known as the, the story of the rich young ruler. The interesting thing about it is that this story is also covered in all of the other three Gospels, in all of the three Gospels. And the focus of each of one is the fact that this man was rich. He had possessions. Um, the man was rich in Mark, in verse tw uh, 22. And Matthew uh, stated that he was, a, he was young. And only Luke, uh, 18 and 18, said that he was a ruler. It is a pronouncement story really focusing on what Christ says in verse 21. Let me read that again for you. Uh, then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thy lack is, go thy will, sell whatever thy hast, and give to the poor, 
and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Um, the entire section emphasizes the riches made being a disciple difficult, but the rewards of discipleship are worth more than material possessions. Jesus did not teach that wealth is evil. He did not teach that poverty is better than riches. He did not teach that only the poor can be saved. He did teach that discipleship is costly. It costs you something to be a disciple of Christ. In fact, let me park here for a minute and, and, and kind of throw this into your spirit for a moment for you to think about. One of the issues of the day in the church is that we are quick to pronounce the fact that we are a Christian, but we're very slow in pronouncing the fact that we are a disciple of Christ. Oftentimes what happens is that we're more concerned about making Christians as opposed to disciples. And the real difference is easy to say I'm a Christian because simply by acknowledging the fact that I'm a Christian, what I do is emphasize what Christ has done for me. But when I talk in terms of being a disciple, I have to talk in terms of an announcement of what I have done for Christ. And oftentimes we're content simply to just be saved and on our way to glory. Um, now in verses 23 to 27 contains two aspects of the kingdom mentioned above. It is to be entered through responsive faith and obedience and received as a gift. The rich man is an example of one who tried to enter it by doing something. He had a work ethic. He had the, he had the ideal of working his way into heaven. And some of us have that same idea of the day. Even in the church, there's this idea that we can work our way into heaven, work our way into grace. And that is not at all what Christ what the Bible teaches us. He stands in stark contrast to children who have nothing and who could do nothing to enter into the kingdom of God. There are, there, there are three major points that I want us to get out of our, our, our time today. And, and the first is this. We must redefine success. Um, Mark began this section by reminding his readers that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He was on his way to the cross. And as he was going there, this young man, this, this rich ruler, came to Jesus, fell down at his feet before him, began to worship him, and to plead with him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, they are, you know, the, the, the commentators are divided over the motive for why the young man came. Did he come out of, did he utter these words out of flattery toward Jesus, or did he utter these words out of respect? In view of Jesus' reaction to him, it would appear that Jesus perceived what he did out of respect for who he was. The question is also unusual because most Jews would have no doubt about what to do. Observe the law. They was about the law. They was people of the book. And it was simply a matter of obey the law, obey the commandments, you have your uh, promise of eternal life. Uh, probably the man had heard about Jesus teaching. You know, he had been there, heard in there, he's a rich man, you know, so he, he's aware of what's going on in the scene. So he heard Jesus, may even heard him speak at, at one point or another as Jesus was ministering throughout Galilee and around Jerusalem and, and, and wherever he went. So he may have heard or heard others talk about Jesus and Jesus talking about the kingdom of God different than what he's probably read, what he's probably studied, what his understanding of was. Um, it was natural for a man who had possibly inherited his wealth to also think in terms of the, of, of the same ideal of being inheriting the kingdom of God. So the concept of his thinking may have been the same. The story of this rich man is recorded all through the gospel, as I mentioned, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Taken together, these accounts create a vivid portrait of a man who fell short of his enormous potential for a life that could have counted for eternity. 
he had all the potential, he had all the degree, he had everything he needed to really make an impact for all eternity, but he missed it. He missed that opportunity. Uh, the young man possessed an abundance of the primary resources we've been talking about. The fact that the three gods already mentioned his wealth means that that was the most notable thing about him. That was the one thing the three, the, the different stories want us to get out of this man. The man was loaded. The man was filthy rich. He had money. The man was, a, a, was, was young. He had you know, no financial needs. He had plenty of time on his hand. He could pretty much do what he wanted to do. He was a local authority figure because they you know, the, referred to him as a leader. He had talent. He had ability. He had, you know, he had prestige. He had, had, had recognition in the community. He was a man that was well respected. He had it all. He had it going on. He had it set. But in spite of everything he had, in spite of all of that, he recognized the fact that something was missing in his life. Now, you know, now, now it didn't say that he gradually just kind of walked up to Jesus, kind of casually had a conversation with him. It dramatically indicated the fact that the man came, threw himself down at Jesus' feet and asked him, pleading him, what must I do to inherit eternal life. He knew somewhere in the course of his being, he knew something was missing, that he didn't really have it all together. Now, Jews of Jesus' day, they had a vague notion about afterlife. You know, it wasn't a real big thing for them. Their focus in Judaism focused largely on the present life, on earthly blessings like land, prosperity, and family. This young man wanted something more, a life that counted for eternity. The, the second point I want us to get out of is this. You have to determine what is holding you back from Jesus' definition of success. Not the world's definition, not how the world sees success, but how does Jesus see success? What does he say? What does the Bible say a successful man is? Uh, Jesus had spoken to several rich people, so it wasn't unusual for him to have a conversation with folks who was loaded, you know. Uh, but he's never asked them to sell their possession. He never did. He talked to Zechariah, he had a conversation with Nicodemus, you know, even the, the, the women that supported his ministry, he never asked them to, to, to sell everything, give it all up, and follow him. In that statement, in that statement, Jesus is asking this man to do two things, two critical things that he asked him to do. First he said, go and sell everything, which is shocking to him. But he also tells him to follow me, which is the most important thing that he is asking him to do. Not about the possession, but it's about following him. The one thing that the young man liked was a relationship with Jesus, who loved him and wanted him to reach his full potential. And, uh, conversation today, uh, earlier in the day, and, 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 and I was talking to this young man, and he had, at one point, you know, he, he acknowledged the fact that he went to church, he was after in the church, he was, you know, you know, reading his Bible, he was studying, he was, uh, used to be worship leader at the church, he was really well, so I asked him, well, what happened? He just got sidetracked, he got involved in other things and began to just drift away. And as we began to talk, I began to, to, to try to get him to understand one thing. That, that, that beyond anything else, beyond all that you think, the reality about it is that God created us, that he might have a relationship with us. The most important thing to God is our relationship. He wants that relationship. He created Adam and he placed them in the garden so that he could have a relationship with them, that he could provide, take care of them, love on them, if you will, because that's what he wanted. He sent Christ that he would die on the cross so that our sins would be taken care of, and again, we'd be reconciled back into that relationship with him. All relationships that we value requires a give and a take. You know, the relationship with your spouse, the relationship with your children requires you to give and to take. There's a giving, there's a, there's, a, there's a bending of your will, there's a bending of what you think is right. Because the relationship that's important to you, you work on. And I try to get them to understand the fact is that it is the same thing with God. God wants a relationship with us. 
And if we work on that relationship as we learn about him by reading and studying his word, praying to him, uh, 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 you know, we begin to understand who he is. We begin to recognize that there are certain things in it that need to change. Our personality needs to change. As we draw closer to him, he begins to point out to us those things in us that need to go away. And as we cut away those things, as we let go of the thing, our relationship with him gets better. He wants a relationship with us. That is God's purpose. That is what he wants. That is why he created us, that he may love us and provide for us. This one man, this man, this young man, lacked the ideal of a relationship. Did Jesus beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thy lack is, go thy way, sell whatever thy hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasures in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. In Mark 10, 20, we read, And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Jesus did not imply, deny, that the man was not adhering to the commandments. He didn't say that. You know, he, had, he had made no incident of the fact that the man was not keeping to the letter of the commandments. But what he asked him to do was something to demonstrate that he was willing to observe the spirit of the commandments. One of the things that constantly put Jesus at odds with, with, the, with the leaders of the day, the Pharisees of the day, was the fact that they were so much a stickler, they were legalists. And so they wanted to stick to the letter of the law. And they constantly failed to embrace the spirit of the law. And this is the same thing that, that what happened with legalists and people who are, who, are, who are about to rule in the regulation, is that they fail to see the spirit of the law. When Jesus came and his teaching and everything that he, that he said, it was based on the spirit. He was trying to move people into an understanding of the spirit of the law and not necessarily the letter of the law. For example, when the woman was caught in adultery and she was drugged before Jesus with all her accusers standing there, you know, now, it's interesting the fact that they only brought the woman, they didn't bring the man, but that's, that's for another day. Hello, somebody. But anyway, so Jesus kneeled down and began to write in the same. Didn't say a word. And then they come back to him again. And so he finally said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. In the spirit, the letter of the law says she must be stoned because she was caught in adultery. But the spirit of the law says, hey, you got sin on you too, you know. Are you guiltless? You know, are you really that good that you can stone this woman? And so as a result of that, they went away. It is the spirit of the law that gives liberty. It is the spirit of the law that God is concerned with. And this is what he's trying to get this rich man to understand. Yeah, okay, you've been adhering to the law. You've been obedient to the commandments. But what about the spirit of the thing? Sell everything and come and follow me. But the man was unwilling to part with his money to establish that relationship. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Mark 10, 22. Now, according to verse 22, he was not willing to do what Jesus asked of him. The rich man apparently did not understand what was involved in keeping the commandments. The one thing this man lacked was not understanding of the requirements of the law. That is the letter of the law. He understood the requirements of the law. But radical trust in God. For in order for him to sell everything, give it all away, and follow Christ, would mean for him to trust Christ as his provider. Trust him to provide for him. And this is what he needed to do. But he did not understand that concept. He didn't grasp it. He could not see because he lacked the ability to trust Christ because he trusted in his possessions. He trusted in his stuff. The one thing the man lacked was a devotion to God as demonstrated by compassion for the needy. Notice what he's saying. Christ said, hey, sell it and give it to the poor. Take care of those who are, who are in need. You know, you know, share, the, share the, the abundance of your wealth with those who do not have. Concern yourself about the concern yourself about the downtrodden. Concern yourself about those who are in need. He didn't have that capacity. He didn't have that devotion. Because in order for him to do that, he would have to love God and be devoted to God. And when we love God and are devoted to God, serving others is not a problem. 
but we must first give ourselves to God. If he had, if it had this man truly trusted in the goodness of God, he claimed God to be good, but if he really trusted in his goodness, he would have welcomed Jesus' command as God's best for him. Again, God is only concerned about giving us his best, our best, what is best for us. The command, sell everything and give to the poor, should not be universally applied. He ain't saying, run around here, everybody run out here now. I don't want anybody to run up to this church and start throwing stuff on the door. That's not what he's talking about. You know? It is applied and applied liberally to every professing Christian. Every circumstance does not fit what he's talking about. It pertains to the need of a particular person, each of us, each of us in our own way, in our own individual lives, in the things that we do, have something in our lives which prevent us from giving all to Christ. That's what he's talking about. We have to give up something. We really do in order to be disciples of Christ, in order to be obedient to Christ, in order to follow him. There are some things in our life we simply need to give up. We need to just get rid of it. Uh, uh, we may have to give up other things in order to follow a vocation, a style of life, a sinful passion, a relationship. The call is not to poverty, but to discipleship, which takes many forms. And each of us are called out of our circumstances to enter into a discipleship with Christ. Remember now, in Matthew 28, God said, go forth and make disciples. He didn't say make converts. He didn't say make Christians. He said make disciples. And the reason why we ought to make disciples is because disciples are those individuals who are sold out for Christ. That's how I walk out a song called Sold Out. And that's what he, that, that we need to be, sold out for Christ. But when you're sold out for him, you'll go where he say go. You'll do what you need to do. It doesn't matter what you have and what you do not have because you're sold out. You're on his team and you're out to do whatever he would have you to do. Discipleship is costly. It costs nothing to be a Christian. Hey, that's just the reality about it. It costs you nothing. All you're doing is accepting the gift that God has given through the Son, through the death on the cross of Christ. You are accepting that if you're believing in the fact that He is the Son of God, He died on the cross to, to, for your sins, He rose again on the third day. You accept that, you accept that gift. You accept the work that He has done to bring you back into a relationship with Him. But discipleship means you've got to give up something. You have to give up something in your life. It costs you something in order to be a disciple. It involves sacrifice. It involves obedience. It involves following the example of Jesus. In Mark 10, 23, and Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they have riches enter into the kingdom of God? It must be contrasted, it must be understood in the Jewish attitude toward riches. How, in that, in that time, in that culture, what their view was about riches. The dominant Jewish view was that riches was an indication of divine favor and piety. It was an indication that if God is blessing you to have all these things, then you're right with God, that you're righteous and you're set right with Him. So the more you have, God is blessing you. And this is the, the, the uh, prevailing Jewish thought at the time. You know, being poor was an indication that maybe God is not, you know, you know, not happy with you, so to speak, you know. And it's funny how we also had that same idea and that same view today. We think in terms of those, and most people always talk about the fact that God is blessed. And they look at the blessing, they look at everything that they have, and they see that. And they believe that to be an indication that God has favor and blessings on your life. I'll give you an example. You take someone that is going through, you take a brother or sister in Christ who, who are going through, no matter what the situation may be, you know, they may be having financial issues, they may have, have family issues, job issues, whatever is going through. The first time, and oftentimes the thought that comes to people's mind is that, well, maybe they've done something wrong. And they may need to confess some unconfessed sin in their lives. And that's why all these things is happening. Remember Job? How Job sat there and his friends came. Hello, if you want to call them friends. You know, and then they sat there and they accused Job 
that he must have done something wrong. He needed to confess his sin. And Job said, yo, yo, I ain't done anything wrong. I've been good. I've been doing what I'm supposed to do. But because he was going through all of this, the thought was that maybe there's some sin in this life. Maybe there's something going on. That is the idea and the concept and, 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 and what uh, the author is trying to get us to understand. But in the Jewish thought, in the Jewish thinking at that time, pretty much today too as well, that was somebody, is that blessings, abundance, is the indication that you're good, you're right with God, and he is blessing you. The teaching of Jesus was nevertheless revolutionary in its time, and it remains scandalous today. You know, Jesus did not condemn riches as evil in themselves. They are a temptation, a hindrance, a diversion. They provide false security that makes radical trust in God difficult because as long as we have the money, as long as we have the position, as long as we have these things, we ain't trusting in God. We're trusting in what we have. We're trusting in those things that we have placed our trust in, our 401k and all of our positions and our job, all of these things we are placing our trust in. And in doing that, it is difficult to trust God. And this is what, uh, this is the kind of information that Jesus is bringing. And this is what he's saying about this rich man. He had did all he could. The basis of and it's everything else on his riches and what he's had. You remember the story? And what's the, 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 the another story about a rich man who, who, who had plenty of money, plenty of stuff. You know, he tore down his old barns, built new barns in order to store his stuff, so all the stuff he had. And the angel spoke to him and said, Fool, thy soul is required of you this night. And who gonna get your stuff? You can't take it with you. You know, but that's what it is when we rely on our riches, we rely on what we have, as opposed to trusting and believing in God. Like that rich man, we have all been given time, money, and talent. Like that man, we all want a life that will count for something in eternity. Like that man, Jesus loves us and wants to give us that life. A life that is meaningful. A life that is worthwhile. A life that has eternal uh, impact. That your life has value. That you do those things in this life that impact for all eternity. Because it's not about here. It's really not about this planet. This is a temporary home for a believer. You're simply just passing through. You're a pilgrim on your way to heaven. And the reality about it is that you will spend all eternity with God. So that the things that you do impact in eternity. Uh, and God wants you to live a life here that has eternal blessing, eternal reward, that has an impact. That your life matters, that things that you do, that, you know, what are people going to say about you, you know, when you leave here, you know, and, 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 and how will they perceive you, and, and, and will your life make a difference? Then we all come to that point, you reach a point in your, in your life and you begin to look back, and you begin to wonder, you know, mm, have I really made a difference in the time that I've been in this planet? Have I really made a difference? in the people's lives that I've, that I've come across. Like that man, we all have one thing gets in the way. There's always something. It may be money, success, a career, a relationship, comfort, pride, etc. There is something that God is constantly saying to you that you need to give up in order to be in a discipleship relationship with him. There is something that you need to do, but you won't do it. And you keep holding on to it. There's always something. Now, the final four talks in terms of the fact that Jesus promises a hundredfold reward for those who will give up their lives for him. Let's, let's look at verses 29 to 31. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, well, let's go back. Let's go up to for, uh, verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brother, or sister, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake, and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now, 
Let me see it. Let, let me say that again. He said, "Did you receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land, which persecution and in the world to come eternal life. For many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Eternal reward." Oftentimes, when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to God, when it comes to work, when it comes to here, our focus is on the temporary. We want to minimize our temporary pain and suffering here. And we want to enjoy the riches that we can amass here. One of the, one of the things that, that, that makes it difficult to serve God is our stuff. And we won't leave our stuff. I can remember when um, years before mother passed, that she she was living in a house and she was in there by herself, uh, trying to take care of this whole house. And she needed, you know, and, 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 you know, health was you know was not as good, it was getting you know, it was getting bad. So she needed to leave the house, move into a much smaller place. And, to live in whatever you want to call it, small apartment, and kind of deal with that. But the big issue with her was that she didn't want to leave her stuff. You know, she didn't want to leave her home. She didn't want to leave her stuff. She had always been out. She had always had to think, what was she going to do with her stuff? What was she going to do with her furniture? What was she going to put there? It was not all going to, you know, everything was not going to fit into this apartment. And so she wrestled with it over and over again. And finally, she made the decision to move. And in the process of moving, some stuff she had to get rid of. She had to give away some things, sell some things. Uh, and she finally, you know, she moved into this apartment. And after being there a while, she loved it. You know, she, you know, she didn't have to do all the cleaning she used to do. She had more time on her hands to do other things, to read, to, to, you know, to do whatever it was that she wanted to do. She had more time. And she recognized the fact that all that stuff that she thought was so important wasn't really that important. It is the same thing with us. God wants us to recognize the fact that he has our very best in mind, in store for us. And oftentimes what we think is the best is not his best for us. And sometimes we have to leave stuff. We need to leave our, our circumstances. We need to leave situations. We need to leave people. We need to leave jobs. We need to leave things behind us. Because wherever God wishes to take us, everybody can't go. Whatever he wishes to do in your life, everyone is not invited to go along with that party. Oftentimes we can't serve God because we're so tied to our stuff. We won't go here, we won't do that, we won't do missionary work, we won't go here. If God said, well, I need you to go over here, well, you know, I ain't going over there. So we, we, we stay exactly where we are, doing the same thing we're doing, and we wonder why we're not growing and not making progress in Christ. In closing, let, 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 me, let me share this with you. In Matthew 7, 19 and 20, we find these words. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by thy fruits you shall know them. There is one thing you will always see in a believer's life who follows hard after God and who is being led by the Holy Spirit. And that is fruit in their work. The truth is you cannot fight fruit. You can't deny the fruit because you will see the fruit. That's what Jesus is saying. You will know them by their fruit. We're not called the judge, but we are called to be fruit inspectors. But the irony about that is that we're not to inspect the fruit of another we need to inspect our own fruit. Are you fruitful in your work, in your ministry? Is there good fruit coming from what you are doing? If you are not led by the Holy Spirit in the work you do, you will not bear good fruit of God for God. God wants you to produce good fruit. 
If you are not empowered by the Holy Spirit, you are not producing fruit for eternity the way God desires. Your work and ministry has to model after that of Jesus, who was empowered by the Holy Spirit and did only that which the Father told him to do. He said himself, I did not come to do my will, but I come to do the will of him that have sent me. Whatever your work is, whatever it is that you do, you need to examine your own fruit. You need to look at the fruit in your life. Are you frustrated about your job? Do you find yourself at work? You know, you, the, the moment you get up in the morning, you dread having to go into work. At your work, in your work, is there some degree of creativity or is it flowing out of you? Are you viewing your work from a different perspective, always looking at new ways of doing the same work? And the same thing with ministry. Is you happy and joyful in your ministry? Are you doing it? Is it creative? Is it bearing good fruit? Because if you're frustrated in your work, if you're frustrated in your ministry, if you are doing those things, if there's no joy and no peace, if it does not get you up in the morning and send you out the door, maybe you're not doing what God would have you to do. Bearing fruit is, is, is what a Christian is to do. You are to bear good fruit. Not bad fruit, but good fruit. Whatever your work is, submit it to the Lord. Ask Him to infuse it with life, power, and productivity. Ask Him to flow His Spirit through you and enable you to be more creative. When you do that, it is possible, and you may not like this, but it is possible that God may lead you to leave that work. Because you're not doing what He would have you to do. You're not producing good fruit. And anyone that is engaged in any kind of work, any kind of ministry, and if it's not bearing good fruit, it's bearing sour fruit. You've seen them, ushers and greetings on the door, who has a, you know, a snack of, you know, you know they, they ain't never smiling, they always bitter at me, and they, they hear they all serving them, but they're, their spirit and, and it comes across is negative. You see them, you know them. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They're not bearing good fruit because they're not doing what God has saved you, designed you to do. And that is where a lot of frustration is in. Oftentimes we, 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 we take a job, we, we get into a position, we never sought God out about it, but we decided this is what we want to do because of the money. And so we have the money, we have the possessions, we have the home, we have the car, we have all of the trappings of prosperity. We have all of the trappings of what the world says we ought to have. And we find ourselves sitting in our liberal misery. Even though we have all of these things that the world says that we should have, it is not the success of the world that we are to seek, but what God determines and what God defines as success. And it is. Success is it bearing fruit for eternity, making an impact that has eternal consequences. When you do that, it is possible you may even be led out of the work you are doing at present and into something else if you want, if what you are doing is not what the Lord wants. Again, submitting ourselves unto God allowing him to dictate and determine what we will and will not do. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. The characteristic of a Christian is to bear fruit, good fruit, not just any kind of fruit, but good fruit. He created us for that. He made us. He designed us for the purpose being able to produce good fruit. Our Heavenly Father, my God, we thank you, we, we bless you, we magnify you, we glorify you. Lord, we just thank you for another day that you have allowed us to see. We thank you for your grace and mercy extended unto us. We thank you for your long suffering. Lord, we just thank you for how good 
you have been unto us on this day. For sufficient unto the day and the trouble there is, is all that we have. We have this day, we have this hour, we have this moment. And we thank you, O oh God, that your presence has been in the midst of us, that you have moved and stirred our hearts. We ask, O oh God, that you open us up, that us be set, let us hear what you are saying unto us today. Help us to understand what you have defined as success and to walk in. And help us, O oh God, to look at our lives, look at the things that we do, look at our relationships and our impact, and are we producing fruit, good fruit, for you? We ask that you imprint this lesson upon the hearts of our hearers. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Until next week, be blessed. Of the commandments.